choreography of lights and water, all the better to delight cinema goers, old and young. More news coming up on France 24. And welcome to the France Van Cat interview. I'm Marae Dundas. Now, we all carry toxic chemicals in our bloodstreams, be it from exposure through disinfectants, pesticides, toiletries. For the moment, though, very little is known about the long term effects, how these everyday chemicals alter our hormonal systems and how they may even interact to create what's known as a cocktail effect. Certain studies suggest a link to autism and lower IQs. Joining me here on the set is Barbara Demonex, biologist and Thanks author of Toxic Chemical, uh, co Toxic Cocktail, <laughs> yeah. How Chemical Pollution <laughs> is Poisoning Our Brains. Many thanks for joining us here. Thanks again. Yeah. First up, can you just explain what types of chemicals we're talking about? And in particular, how are we exposed? Is it our food, our clothes, the air we breathe? Give well, us a you've sense. just said it all. Uh, <laughs> it's a variety of chemicals. It's, as you said, it's pesticides, plastics, flame retardants, surfactants, things that we spray on our clothes to keep the water off, uh, things we use in, in the kitchen, in, in the bathroom. Uh, they're everywhere unfortunately so we eat them we drink them we breathe them in and we even put them on our skin so it's a complex situation and we need to do something about it now it's generally generally accepted that exposure to these kinds of chemicals affect thyroid hormone which is essential to brain development absolutely in your book you argue that by disrupting this we're effectively uh, altering iq levels particularly in children yes well um we we go back to this idea that thyroid hormone is absolutely essential for brain development in humans without enough thyroid hormone at the right time Unfortunately, children used to become cretins, which is not a simple insult, but it was a real medical uh, phenotype. Uh, a child that had an IQ of 35 would be a, a cretin would have an IQ of 35. So we're not seeing that today, thank heavens, because every child that's born is tested for in, see, to see if it's got enough thyroid hormone at birth, and if not, to give it thyroid hormone. But we also know that thyroid hormone is necessary. In, in utero, in the, the mother's thyroid hormone will also be determinant in, in, in uh, the child's IQ uh, later in life. So we've got to keep an eye on what's going on in, in utero and we've got to control the number of chemicals that can interfere with this vital hormonal system. I wanted to talk about a rather striking figure. I'm talking about the rise in the rate of autism spectrum disorder in the US. Uh, if we look at these numbers here, one in 250 children back in 2001, latest data suggesting one in 68. For you, these chemicals are part, largely to blame. Where, how, do we, how do we relate this to these findings? Well, by my number of mechanisms, um, by the fact that, well, we know that the human genome hasn't changed, so it's probably something in the environment. People argue that there have been change in diagnostics, but um, these figures are not... in. This, this is not the case for these, these figures. Um, people say that there's more awareness, that, you know, my neighbour says his kids are autistic, so perhaps mine is too. So, yeah, so there's awareness, little changes in diagnosis that are going to change now. It plays a role in, in the number. Yeah, but it's most probably at least 50% has got to be the environment. This is a, a number of uh, experts have, have concluded this. And so um, if it's the environment... We're looking at the intrauterine development, um, uh, what's going on whilst the child's developing in the mother's uh, uterus. And there we're going to find so many chemicals that can interfere with thyroid hormone production and, if, and action that we have to uh, bring onto the scene that this idea of endocrine disruption, hormonal interference by all these chemicals. And every child born today is going to be exposed to, an, at minimum, you know, dozens even hundreds people have measured of, of chemicals in their bloodstream that can interfere, and many of these, about two thirds of them we've tested, uh, can interfere with thyroid hormone action. So thyroid hormone is needed for brain development. We know that, we've known that for hundreds of years. And if, they don't, if a child doesn't have enough thyroid hormone, especially now we know, and that's more recent 
scientific data that we know that um, a mother's thyroid hormone levels will be determinant of the child's IQ. And a mother that doesn't have enough thyroid hormone ha runs a much higher risk of the child being autistic. So we've got a direct relationship to these, autistic, uh, these, these figures on autism. So hypothyroidism, higher risk of autism. Uh, many chemicals known to sh shown to interfere with thyroid hormone signaling increase uh, autism risk. Pesticides, plastifiers, uh, flame retardants have all been shown to, to do this. So the, there's a biologically plausible mechanism that can partially explain this increase in, autistic, in autism figures. One opponent actually said that um, if we look at, if we flip it around, we could also see that over the same time span, there, there's been a huge rise in the amount of organic food that we eat. Yes. If there's a correlation there, we're not necessarily going to blame the rise in autism on organic food. How can we be, be sure by, that it's more likely to be? Yeah, by chemicals? going back to this idea of a biologically plausible mechanism. Because we know that thyroid hormone or interference with thyroid hormone increases the risk of, or low levels of thyroid hormone or interference with thyroid hormone increases the risk of autism in, in the child, then we've got a biologically plausible mechanism that we can relate, and this is what is needed. Now, in the epigraph of your book, you quote Sir Austin Bradford Hill from exactly. 1965, in which he writes, and I'd like to say, I'd like to read it, all scientific work is incomplete. That does not confer upon us a freedom to ignore the knowledge we already have or to postpone the action that it appears to demand at a given time. We don't have all the information on we this right will. now, but what action should we be taking right well, now? Well, we should be legislating. We should be um, introducing laws. Um, Europe is trying to do this. Um, unfortunately, uh, many countries are going the other way. But at least Europe's trying to do that. And we're trying to introduce regulations that will protect consumers from... Uh, the negative effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, there's been many um, uh, attempts to, to bring in this legislation. Europe's now bringing it in uh, if, if the Parliament ratifies what the decisions that were made earlier. You had this called month. in the book, I thought I read somewhere like a case of too little, too late. Uh, you still yes. hold that view? I, it is going to be too late for the children that unfortunately are are born with autism. It mu yes, it's much too late for those children. We can help them, we can give them better education, we can give them better infrastructures, but we must legislate rapidly to, to avoid um, more children being born with these, these dreadful diseases. But what kind of legislation, like, is it more rigorous testing of the chemicals? Is it both. Taking them off the market immediately? Well, this is, yeah, rigorous testing. This is where I declare a, a conflict of interest because I was so shocked by the way that chemicals were tested that I founded a company that now works independently from me, Watchfrog, uh, to test these chemicals. Um, but, yes, we, we need to, better screening of chemicals. We need, uh, and, and the legislation, the appropriate legislation, when, once we've tested them. S too many mar uh, chemicals are on the market today that have not been properly tested, and we know that. Now, you've, you've, you've conducted a lot of your practical research, actually, with, with frogs, with yeah. tadpoles. Yes. How can we be sure that the, the data that you're using could be applied to humans? And perhaps just explain what you found with these. Yes, with these well, we, well, number one, how, how can we use tadpoles? Well, because thyroid hormone is exactly the same. 450 million years of evolution haven't changed one atom in thyroid hormone. Exactly the same in a fish, a frog, etc. So we can use a frog and we can see, we can put a, a fluorescent gene into that frog and see whether it's modified by different chemicals in the environment. This is what we're doing. And doing that, we've seen so many chemicals. This is why I've written my book. Uh, as a concerned citizen and a grandmother, I, I decided that when I saw the number of chemicals that were affecting thyroid hormone signaling in our little tadpoles, I knew that thyroid hormone was exactly the same in, uh, in frogs and in, in us. And so I said, right, well, if, if it interferes with thyroid hormone signaling in a, in a frog, it can also interfere with what's going on during baby's brain's development. And this is what we're seeing with the, other, with the epidemiology. So it does exactly what Bradford Hill, who you just cited, want, wanted us to do when we're looking for plausible mechanisms. You, you intersect the epidemiology with the experimental data, and, and we have it. Do you consider yourself as much an activist as a scientist following, following your research? Well, as I just said, I'm a grandmother. And a grandmother. And a, I'm a, as a grandmother, 
I, I, I had to start writing these books. I've got to help young women today to, to protect themselves whilst we're waiting for the legislation. You can imagine that hearing this for many people listening instills a lot of fear in that at the same time we can't stop living. No, we can't stop living. So could you give us a sense of kind of what kinds of things we could do at work, at home, at school to limit our exposure to these chemicals? Yes, well, <laughs> I think one has to eat organic food. Uh, one really does have to. One has to try and make them... I know we're, we're all time-strapped, we're all short of time, but we've got to try and find that time to make our own food at, at the house, enjoy making it, uh, not buy grated carrots in a plastic uh, container. Is that, yeah. because it's n is that because it's not organic or is well, it yeah. more than that? Well, it's also because, uh, number one, if you buy grated carrots, many of the vitamins will be gone for them by the time you eat them. Num number two, uh, they're in a plastic container that can also that can, that can transfer, uh, can transfer uh, chemicals from the container into the food. Yep. There's lots of reasons to, to pre prepare your own food at the house. At Switch off computers at night. You don't need them on. They're going to release uh, flame retardants into the atmosphere. Uh, reduce the use of um, these sprays that you use to waterproof clothing. Uh, don't use sprays on, to disinfect your kitchen surface, etc. I give lots of examples in the book, so <laughs> lots more. But there's a number of things we can do. But above and beyond all, we need legislation. Barbara Demonex, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us here on France Van Gat. You can watch the full interview also on the France 24 website. I'd like to invite you to stay with us because there's more news coming up.